uh, Theology of the Body, the story of Carol Watiwa. Okay, so this is John Paul II. And for you, for those of you who went to Poland, I guess it's a refresher because you learned everything about the man's life. Uh, but I think it, it is very good. We'll, we'll just run through it quickly. There's a lot that we need to cover, similar to, to last time. Um, but it is good to hear his story. It, it's good to, um, uh, to remember what type of man he was, where he came from, because that's very foundational and, and important to, to the theology of the body. To, he's the artist of it, right? He's the author. So, so he's, he's going deep into his own reflections, into his own heart, and his own historicity. Right? And from that, he's developing these beautiful reflections on the human person, which is essentially what the Alge body is. Right? Um, born in Poland in 1920, by the time he was 21, so 1941, the, the beginning or in the midst of World War II, right? uh, he had lost every member of his family, including his father. Uh, he witnesses the terrors of, of World War II. Um, his brother was about 15 years older than him, Edmund. I, I think, and he had another sister named Olga, who I think died when he was younger. But uh, Edmund was a doctor at 26 by the time he passed away, and uh, and he, he passed away actually because he was taking care of of a sick patient, and he took on that disease, whatever it was. I think it was tuberculosis or something, and, and he passed away through that. He was 26, but um, Edmund has some was a very deep man, similar to to his brother John Paul, and, and John Paul learned a lot from him. So he was the baby. And the family learned a lot. Uh, Edmund taught him how to ski, taught him about nature. They would go hiking into the woods constantly. And when he died, uh, he remembers his father going to, um, by the coffin there at the wake and, and just repeating the words, thy will be done, thy will be done, thy will be done. And that laid a huge impression on John Paul at the very beginning, having, like, experiencing a lot of suffering, a lot of deep suffering. And in, in that suffering, he, again, he matures, right? Father... Um, Michael Sullivan, he's a legionary down in uh, College Station. He works down at a and I don't know if anybody knows him. He worked a little bit here in Dallas. But he says, um, one understands the degree of, uh, one understands maturity. He, he matures when he understands um, empathy, right? To the degree of one's empathy determines his degree of maturity. Right? So John Paul was forced to mature. He, he was forced to mature because of all this empathy that he had to go through, that he had, that he had to suffer with and kind of um, with his family and the loss and then the, the terrors of World War II and his friends, etc. right? So he found um, a lot of consolation at that age in, uh, in acting. So he was a, he's a natural born actor. You see this image of him, even, even the shot of this image, it, it really captures his, uh, his, his soul, yeah, his, his heart, um, the compassion that he had even in, in taking on the play. And he was a lover of the arts, right? He, he always talked about um, music and, and movies and film. And he would write a lot, as Pope, he would write a lot about film and the importance of it and how kind of similar to what we talked about last time, right? That, that in the media, it can wound or it can, it can heal, right? Um, it can divide or it can unite. And so he, he understood the value of that. So he had a deep love for, for the huma humanity and the arts. Um, he was a natural philosopher. Um, right, always seeing the deeper meaning hidden in things. Right, that sacramental vision that we talked about last time. He he just had it, um, and that that was constant. That always came up, and really in the arts, that was the a main key of hope that the Polish people took on because uh, it was underground. Nobody knew about it, and when they when they exercised these plays, they gave hope to the people. Um, and he really saw that in poetry and in the arts, you can inspire and you can you can help people a lot. So Victor, keep it up, my man. Keep up, keep up the filming. And we're there. A few pictures of him. Um, as a young kid, before he would join the seminary, he was kind of enrolled into the army a little bit, and you can tell from his face he didn't like it. <laughs> and uh, he kind of got out of there uh, quickly as possible. But a total leader amongst his peers, everybody really looked up to him. He wore the scapular. I mean, he wasn't afraid. He wasn't afraid of his, his uh, devotion to Catholicism or to Mary, for that matter. When his mother died, um, he... He remembers going to, um, you probably know the story, but he remembers going to a statue of Mary and saying, you'll be my mother now, now that my mother has passed away. Yeah, so he had a, a strong devotion to the Blessed Mother and great leader amongst his, his peers, yeah. Um, watch out. At, at the age of um, 26, I think he, he became a priest. So 1946, um, and he says, uh, this is from Mary Healy, Men and, Women, he, uh, Men and Women Are From Eden. Excellent book on theology, buddy. Great synopsis. I'm sorry we don't have 
uh, a copy of it here. We have a display of Theology of the Body books. Uh, but great, great book for a, a good synopsis of the whole thing. Very easy read. She says, Carol, what you have recognized long ago that in the war between good and evil in our day, it is these matters relating to the body, sex, marriage, and the family that are the battleground. All right, so even from the, from the very beginning of, of his, his call to the priesthood, he, he really felt that these matters relating to the body, to sex, to marriage were all related. You, you cannot disconnect the body from sex. You cannot dis disconnect the sex from marriage, right? They're, they're all uh, interconnected. He loved to go camping, as, as most of you know, right? He would, he would take them out into nature because, again, in nature, that's, that's a perfect moment for a retreat, right? We've probably been on the, the best moments of, of reflections and times with God is, is when we're camping, right? Or when we're just out in nature soaking up the, the roses, similar to what we talked about last time, right? The more we get in touch with the creation of God, the more we can understand God, right? And he knew that. And he wanted to teach the young people about that. Um, Bill Donahue, actually, I'm taking a lot from him and Christopher West up at the Institute um, there in Philly. And he says he has this little six-year-old boy. And like most boys, you know, like they're, they're very, like, aggressive kind of. And they're, they're running. And you see a dandelion, you want to kick it because you like when all this stuff goes all over the place. Like that's just something that boys are wired to do, to kick flowers and whatnot because they're just standing up and they're a great football and so he, he kind of like calms them down. He's like, no, 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 look, look at the beauty of that. Don't, don't destroy it, right? Don't, don't, this thing is, is united. So even in the littlest things, we're, we're, we're seeing something very fundamental to who we are. We're supposed to be united. We're meant to be in communion with each other, with ourselves, yeah, with our bodies. Our, our bodies are connected to our souls. That's very fundamental to theology of the body, right? God and the body. God and the human person, right? Incarnation. We're going we're gonna to get into that later on. So, so that's something that even, I think, very fundamental to how we teach kids. Like when we, I mean, we, a lot of us are young here. We grow up and, and have our own kids um, to teach them the sacramental vision. That's something that we, we constantly need to be going back into, right? The, the beauty of nature, the beauty of creation, what it is, what it means. Yeah? So he knew that was, they were going to be much more receptive to his message, teaching them, if they were around the message, right? They, they lived in the message, yeah? And he, he would live it out, right? The great, great quote from um, Jason Everett's book, uh, The Five Loves of John Paul. John Paul the Great, book's over there. Excellent book. If you want to learn more about the story of John Paul II, please read that book. Like, amazing and so inspirational. Like, he nails it. Has anybody read it? Have, yeah, excellent. I mean, and go back to it. It's one that just, I, when, I, when I'm kind of going through a rough patch, like suffering, read the part on the cross. And the examples and the stories about John Paul and how he embraced the cross. Beautiful. How he embraced young people. His, his, his loves, right? I think they are the Eucharist, Mary, young people, um, the cross, and human love. Beautiful, beautiful stuff. Um, anyway, he says, While hiking to a campsite or paddling across a lake in a two-man kayak, the youths absorbed his wisdom and insight. Sometimes during the hikes, he would drift to the back of the group and spend a few hours in contemplative prayer. One of the hikers, Polish name, said, we even had a saying, <laughs> uncle went on the mountain. They would call him uncle because he was in hiding and, and um, he couldn't be called father. Uncle went on the mountain. Of course, he did not go on the mountain, but rather to, a sol to any solitary, secluded, quiet place. He prayed the rosary and chaplet of divine mercy. This is an... This is in the 40s, 50s, well, 60s, when he's doing that. That's very new. Faustina had just had those reflections, and he learned that devotion. That devotion was not popular in any way at that time, but he learned it, and he would pray it. I thought that was pretty fascinating. We had a feeling that he was praying um, all the time, right? Living out John Paul or um, St. Paul's quote, yeah? Pray without ceasing. He, he would constantly do that. And he would surround himself with the beauty of nature. That's how he, he, that's how he would pray. And you see him, he's not worried. He's exercising the, the sleep in St. Joseph method. We've been working on that devotional, the sleeping saint, praying to sleep in St. Perhaps those in the front who are planning a, a wedding, maybe we, um, don't worry, no, no need to worry about certain things. It's going to be taken care of. We're, it's going to happen. We're, we're going to get married. <laughs> Otherwise, this thing's so Again from Mary Healy, long before he was Pope, Carol Wattil was friends with and counseled hundreds of married couples. 
He dealt with virtually every human struggle in the confessional. He was thinking, writing, and reflecting philosophically on the meaning of the human person, the body, love, and sexuality at a time when it was very unusual for a prelate to do so. As a young priest and bishop, his views were considered avant-garde and daring. No, no, especially no priest would ever come out and, and say the certain things he was saying, right? And to that, um, well, we'll get there in a minute. But there he is. That, that's a picture of a saint hanging out. A saint, and, and a saint in nine years. Do you realize how ridiculous that is? Like, that doesn't happen in our time. It takes years. The, the church is a crock pot. It's not a microwave. And, <laughs> and it takes time. The Holy Spirit takes time. No one has just canonized a saint right away. And nine years, because everybody knew. Everybody knew he was a saint. Um, he was a professor at Lublin University there in Poland, and that's when he developed talks, and those talks uh, turned into the, a famous book in 1960, Love and Responsibility, and uh, we'll look at that in a second. There he is being um, made a cardinal, I believe, by uh, Paul VI, the man who would write Humanae Vitae, and I think very, very much at a similar time, uh, right before Vatican II, that's what's happening. Yeah. Great shots of him. What a, what a great guy. How, how awesome would that be to be like married on his feast days? Wouldn't that be crazy? Uh, Wait a minute. <laughs> we are being married on our feast I'm just, sorry, I forgot about that. Love and Responsibility, written in 1960. As a cardinal, he begins to answer more profoundly the whys behind the what of moral issues. A big reason for, for, for this was he was seeing more and more, especially the hundreds of, of married couples that he was talking to, the, these engaged couples, all of them, he was just, it's tradition for tradition's sake. They're, they're white-knuckling themselves through this. The confessions that he would hear, he, this thing was coming up over and over and over again. He was, and he realized, in the church, yeah, we explained it. St. Augustine had it. He, he figured it out. But it was almost in a sense that they didn't have to go through and explain it. And now he's realizing times are changing. And we need to go in an in-depth understanding of the person. Love and responsibility. Confusion about sexual morality involves a danger perhaps greater than is generally realized. The danger of confusing the basic and fundamental human tendencies, the main paths of human existence. Such confusion must clearly affect the whole spiritual position of man. One of his students, and I think there's a quote in your books, said to him, um, uncle or whatever they call him, father, uh, why, why are you talking so much? This is when he was teaching at Lublin, University of Lublin. Why are, you teach, why are you talking so much about sexuality? Like there's more important things. Why do you got to bring up sex all the time? And he's like, there is nothing wrong with sexuality, but the abuse of sexuality is one of the main obstacles to spirituality. Mm, chew on that. Gosh. The devil attacks that which is most sacred. Yeah? And, and is... What is being attacked the most? Gosh, just turn on the radio, just read the newspaper, watch the headlines. It, it, is, it is this fundamental idea of who we are. Your sexuality is your identity. What do they look at? What does the doctors look at first? To, to recognize who you are, to, to identify who you are between your legs. It's your sexuality. We find out if you are male or if you are female. And we celebrate that. We celebrate that once we find, we have reveal parties. Think about that. Like, wow, that we celebrate blue balloons coming out of the box, meaning it's going to be a boy. And, we, and we, we're like, yes, that, because that is a huge, we know it's a human person. We, we know that mom and dad aren't going to create a giraffe. Like, we know it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a human. What's the big deal? Why do we have these reveal parties and get so excited about the gender? Because it's the identity. It's our identity. I am a, I am a male. I am a boy. <laughs> We have boys, we have girls, and it's beautiful. We need to celebrate it. Like, what are we doing now? Where are we having boxes and blue balloons and pink balloons are coming out? And right now, he's starting out as a boy, but he's gonna, he could turn into a girl later on. We don't know. And, and did you see the time? Christina and Chelsea were telling me this earlier. The Time magazine of a man breastfeeding. But it's not a man. It's a woman. It's a, it's a woman. And she... 16 whatever years old she became a man and it, and this thing is being celebrated it's being celebrated that a, a man is breastfeeding beard and all the main paths of human existence such confusion we're a little confused 
must clearly affect the whole spiritual position of man. If we don't get this right, we don't get our spiritual nature right. And, and again, this goes back to the fundamental essence of, uh, of human and divine. We are human and we are spiritual. If we don't tap into our spiritual nature again, if we don't pray, if we don't learn how to pray, we're not human. We're not human. That's why everything the Catholic Church teaches, if we really believed it, if we really exercised it and persevered in, in everything the Catholic Church said, and we understood why the Catholic Church, we would be human. To be Catholic is to be human at its, at its essence, at its core, right? That's why it's so beautiful. And not just that, to be Christian. It's a Christian message, right? But the Catholicism we know has the fullness of the faith. But morality reflects nature. It, it's not the church imposed, it's not these celibate men in Rome telling us what to do with all these rules and regulations, stop oppressing me, Father, leave me alone. No, it, they're just saying, do you want to be full? Do you want to be fully alive? Do you want to be, glorify God, right, St. Irenaeus? The glory of God is man fully alive. When, when we look at this method, and I, I'm kind of getting into this method right now of John Paul, he uses the Slavic method, right? It's not linear, it's not American, right? It's not A, B equals C. It, it's, it's rotative, right, it's didactic. We, we're going to look at a point, and you're going to be like, Ryan, like we talked about this last time. Why are you bringing it up again? No, we have to see it again. And when we see it again, we're going deeper. We're going deeper, right? A, a screw holds tighter than a nail. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? When we screw it, we've got to screw in. We've got to screw this in, right? When we, when we screw it in, we're, it, we're, we're holding it tight, yeah? Then just one time. We can't just look at it one time. No, no, no. All right? Catechesis. Right? Theology of the body is a catechesis. The word catechesis means echo. To echo. To repeat. To hear it over and over again. We've got to hear it over and over again. And we've got to let scream it out of the mountaintops, right? And let it echo back to us. Right? And, and this needs to come back to us. Okay? So it, it's not just these talks that, I, that we're doing here. It's not just these presentations. But it's, it's taking this to the chapel, as we mentioned before. And it's reading it. What is he saying? What is he talking about? This is a message for our time. And, and if we don't get it right, we're not going to get our spiritual nature right. Our, it's, a, it's a block to our spirituality. Wow. Huh. It's, it's not just about sex. Uh, the sex talk, theology of the body. No. 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 It's so much more than that. So much more. An elected pope, October 16th, 1978. His first installment as, um, as, a, as a pope was October 22nd, which is why it's feast day. It's October 22nd. Okay, theology of the body objectively. We're going to talk about two different parts. Objectively, what it is, and then we're going to go on a tangent. I'm <laughs> preparing you for the tangent. Um, called personalism, which is, uh, again, what we, the study of the human person according to John Paul. Okay. Um, and then we'll talk about theology, theology of the body subjectively. But we'll probably take a break in between them. Okay, um, three points here. 129 Wednesday audiences delivered by Pope John Paul II between 1979 and 1984. Um, that's what it is. It's, it's um, all these Wednesday audiences. It was, a it was a book that he wanted to publish as Cardinal, but got a little distracted, became Pope. And then all of a sudden, he gets to proclaim this from the papal seat. Not only does he proclaim it to, the, to his good parishioners there in Poland, which would have been great, but no, now, now he's raised to Vicar of Christ. Right before he's about to deliver, to publish this book, he's raised. Right before, 1978. And in 1979, one year into it, a couple months into it, he starts proclaiming the theology of the body. Very important. Super, super important. What was he saying? This is a message for our time. He, he knew the young people. You know, the, a lover of the human person, of, of young human love, right? He knew the human person. He knew how fundamental this was for them, right? And so as they, as they gathered, he knew that this was going to be projected for the next thousands of years. I mean, if, if he's named a doctor of the church, which I, I wouldn't be surprised, it's, it's because of this. And, I mean, the 26 encyclicals that he wrote on every human topic. But in every topic that he touched on, in every book, in every writing, pick it up. Any type of writing from John Paul, yes, it's heady, of course. But... The, these elements, these fundamental elements of theology of the body, you're just going to be like, wow, that's TOB. Wow, that's, that's, a, that's a theology of the body perspective. You know, he had those lenses, right? And those are the lenses that we need to have. We need to walk around the world and, and put these 
TUB glasses on, right, in order to see the world through this, this type of perspective, right? Because it's the perspective of a mystic, right, of a man who was deeply in love with Christ himself. And, and through that, he, he had a love for the, for the human person, right? And through that, he became a saint. That's, that's all it is, you know. But he explained it, and this is the exp explanation. An in-depth biblical reflection. Okay, we're going we're gonna to look at a lot. Next three um, classes, we're going to look a lot at, um, at the book of um, the Gospels, right? The good news. Biblical reflections on the meaning of human embodiment, particularly as it concerns our creation as male and female, and the call of the two to become one flesh. Sex, sexuality, identity. We have to talk about it. it, it it's, not, it's not a taboo. It's nothing we should be scared of. It's nothing we should... It's sacred. It's holy. It's good, true, beautiful from, from the Creator. And if we understand it properly, we're going to understand our, ourselves properly as man, as woman. And then we'll relate to, to everybody in a different way. And, and we'll open up our eyes to understand the beauty, the beauty of how we're supposed to live this life, right? An adequate anthropology. These catechetical are from George Weigel, who, by the way, Stephen Weigel uh, helps us with our website at Birth Choice. No big deal. But his son, Stephen Weigel, um, good, good man, never met him, but sent a few emails to him. George Weigel, kind of a big deal, witness to Hope, the, the biographer of the Pope. These catechetical addresses taken together constitute a kind of theological time bomb set to go off with dramatic consequences sometime in the third millennium of the church. Let's know. When that happens, perhaps in the 21st century, the theology of the body may well be seen as a critical moment not only in Catholic theology, but in the history of modern thought. From the perspective of, of a man who is very much an intellectual, he's not just a feeler, goes through, it's, this isn't about feelings. We, if we get some feelings, yes, let it penetrate the heart because we need to take that journey, right, from head to heart. But um, this man especially, when he says that, that's a lot of weight. That's a lot of weight. He studied a lot of popes. He knows church documents like the back of his hand. He's, he studied the Second Vatican Council. And the, the weight that he's given to theology of the body with these words is very important. Very important. He continues, um, it's John Paul's masterwork, his masterpiece, his catechesis par excellence. It can serve as John Pauline lens for reading the catechism. If you've heard of Pauline lens, that's, th that's through the lens of St. Paul, right? Um, now we're talking about a John Paul lens. You don't say that to a normal person. That's, that's doctor of the church worthy. Um, and if we read the catechism, we can understand it better through the theology of the body. And I'm kind of going to talk about this a little bit in theology of the body subjectively, at least my own experience of it. I'm a Catholic because of it. I, I don't think I would be so ingrained in my faith and understand my faith if it wasn't for this teaching. I, I haven't been white knuckling my faith because I understand this and I love it, and I've embraced it. And so I don't have to white-knuckle myself through all these rules and regulations of, of what the church... No, the church is... It's a mother, right? And Pope Francis is reminding us of this constantly. He's a great predecessor um, or forerunner. Someone to come after. <laughs> John Paul II. That's the word I'm thinking of. Church of Okay, structure of the theology of the body. There's two parts, and we're just looking at one part. I'm so, <sighs> we're just looking at one part, the words of Christ. Um, okay, and that's what we're going to start uh, next time. We're going to look at original man. Um, Christ appeals to the beginning. Take the glory be. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning. Historical man. Christ appeals to human nature. Is now. Now. During, all right, before the fall during the fall, the fall itself, and ever shall be, right? Christ appeals to the resurrection, eschatological man. When we look at eschatological man, we're going to look at our destiny. It's a good one. It's all about heaven. Historical man's going to be tough. We'll have the tissues out. It's going to, I'm telling you now, it's going to be a tough one to get through. It's a long one, but we got to go through it. we got to go through it. An original man, it's going to be, it's, it's very nostalgic. Uh, we'll look at that next time. That, that also is a long one. Okay, we're just looking at these three. Part two is that concept of white knuckling. You, white you did it because you didn't want to get yelled at. And, and that whole concept of, and we're actually going to watch a video in a, in a second, uh, that kind of uh, summarizes this a little bit. 
but a, a few ways of explaining the pendulum swung from one extreme to the other. This, this, this extreme of, of perhaps in the 40s and 50s, you, you did it. You did it because it was tradition. You did it because your parents did it. You just didn't, you didn't um, challenge it. You just did it. And if you asked why, you were pretty much told, don't do it. Don't do it or else you're going to hell. And I remember um, a story of my mother, and, uh, and I've told this, we've laughed about it. She, she kind of apologizes for it. She knows it wasn't the best, but at the same time, like, who, you know, it was just how she was raised. It's how they, everybody was raised, I think. There wasn't a, a clear explanation. So I remember being like 10, 11, going to a friend's house over the weekend and, and just staying the night, hanging out with them. And uh, my mom picked me up from the house, my friend's house, at Sunday night. Like eight o'clock, we got back to the garage, and I remember being in the garage. We pulled the car into the garage, and, and she's like, so where'd you go to Mass this morning? And I'm like, well, Anthony didn't, he didn't go to Mass. He's Catholic, but his, his, he didn't go. His parents didn't go, so I didn't go to Mass. And she's like, you didn't what? You didn't go to Mass? Do you realize that's a mortal sin? Do you realize if you died right now, you would go to hell? And I'm, and I'm like, oh my gosh! <laughs> I'm sorry. How can I go to mass and being like scared to hell? I was scared as hell, like that I didn't go to mass and I was, and it worked. I didn't miss. I haven't missed mass since. It worked. It did work. But is that is it the best way? And, I, and I've had this conversation with mom, and she says she would say no. Like the best way is to motivate to to motivate out of love. You want to do it out of love for Jesus, not out of fear of Jesus. Because what can that do? And I, and I think that's kind of the mentality of what was happening. <clears throat> At the time, you just, you, you didn't do it, you know? And, um, and that kind of, it just brought a, a bad kind of negative um, reflection of the church. That the ch church is a nun who takes after you with the ruler. Because it did happen, and we have to fess up to it. But John Paul, again, he's looking at this in, in the 70s, and when he becomes Pope, and he's like, enough, enough. We know good and well, the church has always known. And it's a fallacy to think that, oh, the church just made its reflection about why it's always taught this. No, the church has always known. Christ taught us. Christ taught us. The apostles taught us. But we've lost it. We lost it in, in the period of Jansenism. And if you know about Jansenism, it, it's earning your way to heaven. I, if I pray this many Hail Marys, if I do this many Novenas, and darn it, I forgot that ninth day. Ah, it's okay. It's okay. God wants your heart, right? Augustine's famous quote. I love this quote. Love and do whatever you want. Mm. Mm -hmm. just love love and do whatever you want you can do whatever you want why because if you're loving properly you're not going to do anything that's sinful you're not you're loving why why would you do something contrary to love you're acting according to your nature you're acting according to how you're created to be of what you're supposed to do love and do whatever you want right i would tell that to my students constantly i made them memorize it in latin gvj quote vis fox say it over again come on <laughs> love and do whatever you want and it's internalize it, right? Internalize the faith. Yeah, and then you do it out of love. And this, John Paul, another point in the theology of the body is this, this conversation from ethic to ethos, right? Ethic is the Ten Commandments. Ethic is the law. We, we know the law, but that law needs to, needs to form into the eight Beatitudes, right? Look at the difference between the Ten Commandments, thou shall not, as opposed to blessed are you, right? It's kind of more of a positive spin. Blessed are you if, you if you have mercy, right? Because mercy is going to be given to you. Yeah, that's, that's ethos. That's internalizing the law, right? I don't need my mother to tell me to go to Mass on Sundays. I, I don't need a phone call from her saying, hey, did you go to Mass? No, and, and she's not going to do that. Why? Because she's trained me. She, she, I needed it in the beginning. In the beginning of my life, I needed that. I needed that discipline, that structure, that, uh, that telling what to do, right? But I've internalized it. Right? And so I don't need that. We, we don't need that anymore. We've internalized the faith. We love the faith. That's why you're here. You want to know more about it. Yeah? But it wasn't so much like that, right, in this, in this context. There was no adequate answer being taught for the meaning of human sexuality, right? Sexuality wasn't added or equated to identity, and it still isn't. Right? The method that John Paul is using approaches the reality of things by studying the ordinary experiences, phenomena, of everyday life. Yeah, feel free to get a drink. To <clears throat> John Paul is saying with his glasses. Phenom this different approach, right? This is a Slavic method. It's not linear. It's not A to B. We're, we're going to be repeating ourselves. We're going deeper in this, yeah? Approaches the reality of things by studying the ordinary experiences. What does that mean? With 
human experience as a point of departure, we are better able to reflect honesty, honestly on our own self-experience and see if what is proposed is confirmed within us. That, that's a proper way of approaching sexuality, of approaching the truths of the faith, of approaching the things that need to come. Not, not an opposition, right? I'm, I'm going to oppose this on you, oppress this on you, right? Um, no, 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 but let me present truth. Is this adequate? Does, does morality reflect nature? When you give of yourself, when you go on a mission trip to Haiti or whatever, and you give yourselves to those kids, are you finding joy? Are you finding this fulfillment that you were lacking before when you were just thinking about yourself? If so, hmm, okay, well maybe what I'm saying isn't crazy. Maybe the Catholic Church isn't crazy, after all. Maybe they have been right. Maybe this is fundamentally Christian, right? And we've just lost it. We've lost the way. What if once you, life can be beautiful. Life can be beautiful. There, there are so many, you can live a joyful, beautiful life. You really can, right? Don't give it away, yeah? So phenomenology is the method that he's approaching. It's not an opposition. It's a, it's a proposal. He's proposing, what do you think about this? Do you like it? Do you like it? Is this true? According to your own human experience? According to your own life historicity? Yeah? If so, okay. Then, then let that be, be by which you take that journey from head to heart. Right? And no longer is it, I need to go to Mass, but it's I want to go to Mass. I, I want to pray the rosary. I want to do this novena because I understand that it's helping me. I understand that it, it's, it's joyful to God, right? It, it glorifies God. It's helping me become a human person, right? This isn't for just Catholics. is isn't just for Christians. It's for the world, right? It's for the world. Not a lot of people know about it. There are, mi- there are few people who can really see. Remember that quote from Joe versus the volcano, yeah? There are few people out there. We need to, we need to see, right? If we, if we have these lenses, right? Call it TOB lenses, whatever. But, but put them on and, and let's see it from this perspective. Okay, okay. Subjectively, what is it? We'll go through this quickly. The song of songs you've been hearing your whole life. Look inside yourselves. What, what this is doing, it's a proposal. Is it true? Look at, think back. Think about your childhood. What has God been talking to you, saying to you? What's in your heart, right? He's constantly trying to talk to us through events, through people, through stories, through what happens on the day-to-day. He's not distancing himself from us unless we distance ourselves from him. All of what you already know deep down in your heart and the answer to the ache, this was the one thing that got me. I was 21 when I discovered the theology of the body. I was in Ireland. I had never heard of it before. I never had an an explanation, I probably wouldn't have been receptive to it. Actually, I think I remember hearing Jason Everett speak when I was like 14 and like fell on deaf ears. I don't know what the guy was talking about. I was fooling around with my friends. But I think I remember uh, my godparents, huge into theology of the body, would send me letters quoting John Paul. Eighth, ninth, twelfth grade. Cool. Don't understand it. Thanks. Love you too. Didn't get it, right? But I think at this point I was my second year of novitiate in the seminary and a lot of prayer, a lot of reflection, a lot of new things coming up and I was receptive to it. Like I told you when I, when I gave this course to the seniors, mm. some of them got it, some of them got it, but not a lot. Pros to the swine for the most part. But I think we're at a point and if this is new to you, we're receptive to this and it's like, wow, okay. There's something else here, right? For me, it was the ache. I just had this ache in the heart. Oh, did I have an ache? Gosh, it was, <laughs> it was deep. It was deep. I couldn't understand it. I couldn't understand it. But there, it was there. Something was there. And this was filling some void. I was like, wow, this is good stuff. This is good stuff. Um, C.S. Lewis talks about this German word called Zainschund. Any Germans in the room? I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. But it means longing for or intensely missing something. The scream, right? From Edward Mucz. The scream. We're going to look at this in Historical Man. We're going to look more at the ache, actually. We're we're just wetting the palate. Uh, But longing for or intensely missing something. There's something that's not right. A lot of people live in the world, the Joe Schmoes, going through life, missing something. I don't know what it is. Yeah? 
a, a brain cloud. I knew it. I didn't know it, but I knew it. A brain cloud. Mm. He, that was it. Right? What are they ultimately missing? Yeah. The divine, the spiritual nature that they're not tapping into. They're not praying. Of course you're not happy. <laughs> How, really, no one who prays. Imagine someone who doesn't pray. A lot of people out there. Wow, I couldn't imagine life. I could not imagine life without a prayer life. Wow. Foreign. Foreign. Not, not how we're meant to live. This is Jacob uh, meeting Rachel at the well. Yeah? A lot of beautiful stories in the, in the Bible uh, about the meaning of two people at, at a well. My heart is restless until it rests in you. My heart, right? This image of him putting his heart. Um, okay, human love, of course, but human love is a reflection of divine love. If God talks to us, these beautiful and this is something we're not going to be able to have time to, to go deep into. We'll look at it a little bit. But the Song of Songs, right? Read the Song of Songs, and it's, it's God's love story. It's poetry. And it's very intimate, very sexual. Poetry, beautiful. What is it saying? God's intimate love for us. He doesn't want us to leave it at the head. He wants us to go deep into the heart. Go deep. Go deep in me. I remember my, my mother and testify, a mystic woman. She's very holy. And I remember being at a tough moment in, in my life and kind of expressing some things, and, and she told me to go to the wounds of Christ. Go there. Go to the wounds. of. Let that be your hiding place. Oh, what does that mean? What are you talking about? Wounds of Christ. Never thought I would go there as a hiding place. Wow. That's where we're supposed to go. That, that's what we're getting at here. My heart is restless. It's going to be restless. We're, we're created for the infinite. Kid president, we're, we're created for love. We come from love, created for love, and we need to sp share love, whatever. Nailed it. Nailed it. Summary of theology of the body. Thank you, kid president. Theology of the body subjectively. Kid doesn't know John Paul. Doubt it. Doubt that he's read the theology of the body. <laughs> really doubt it. But what's he doing? Heart. He already knows it. Yeah? It's been taught to him. He's on the right path. Everybody knows this. It's looking into our hearts, our hearts that have been created for God to, to find it. We, we can't stay on the superficial level. we got to go deep into this stuff. We can't just pass it off. He's looking for his keys. No, no, no. It's wonder. It's wonder. Yeah. Yeah. Mumford and Sons. <laughs> Mumford and Sons. Doubt they've read the theology of the body. I, I really doubt it. But man, when you, these people, listen to their lyrics. Wow. Love that will not betray you, dismay, or enslave you. It will set you free. Write a book. Be more like the man you were made to be. There is a design, an alignment to cry of my heart to see the beauty of love as it was made to be. Secular. They're not Christian by any way. They're secular artists. They're reaching into their heart. They're not staying on the superficial level. They're, they're realizing what's going on. What does it mean to be man? And when they, when they apply this to the instrumental, the lyrics to the instrumental, y'all went to the concert. I didn't go. want to go. But who are you people? Wow. Theology of the body subjectively. There it is. There it is. We all know it. It's the cry of, it's the song. It's the song we've been hearing our whole lives, right? What is theology of the body? A few things, few definitions here. This is my favorite. The transposing of the eternal love song of the Trinity into the temporal corporeity of man and woman. Mm? Like that? Did the students have to memorize that? Maybe. Maybe not. Great mystery of how the invisible is made visible through the physical. Okay, okay. A total vision of the human person. Yeah. Ephesians 5, right? We'll get into that later on. Answer to the sexual confusion of the day. A heart of the Word made flesh, right? Incarnation itself. Okay. This is theology of the body. What makes the human body theological as opposed to an extended thing, as opposed to Descartes' method of dualism, right? <clears throat> the body is a reflection of God, right? Christ is the theology in the body, yeah? Our, our bodies are intimately related to the theology, to the spiritual. They're not separated. We're not just bodies. 
I had a, when I taught this to missionaries when I was still in the seminary, um, I was trying to get this point through and, and this one guy was like, I don't, I don't understand what you're talking about. Like, he, and in the image he said was glove over the hand. It's, your body's a glove over the hand. It's just part of it. It's part of it and it's always on, but it's not you. And I was like, oh, dualism. My dualism alerts were going off like crazy. I was like, this is terrible. And, and interesting because he lived his, his life in a way that was, that was that kind of like seeking perfection, but, but white knuckling a lot of stuff and really hard on himself and not really like embracing some things and just chilling, relaxing, let it go, go, smell the flowers, you know? Like, he just wasn't, wasn't doing that. He lived very intensely, very smart, bright guy. And, and I told him, okay, all right. He was like 18, 19 years old. I hit you in the face. What are you going to say? You, you hit my left cheek. Don't hit my left. No, you hit me. You, even in our language, we know that our bodies are ourselves, a manifestation of our persons, of who we are, right? And he was like, oh, okay. All right. Kind of makes some more sense, right? But, but yeah, you're intimately part of your body. Do not separate your body from your soul. Do not think it's some platonic. No, 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 because what does that do? Sex is taboo. Sex is tainted, dirty, evil. I, I, I have to live spiritual. I have, where are my wings? I'm an angel. No, no, no. We, we, we're not angelic. We're not. We're human beings. And God himself became a human being. Why? To teach us. To teach us how to be human. We forgot. We totally forgot. Have we not? Yes. We forgot after Cain killed Abel. <laughs> I mean, second generation. After that, it's just a spiral downfall. Like, and eventually, all right, something's got to give. I'm going. I will go. Second person of the Blessed Trinity, they were having a meeting. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit having a meeting. We've got to fix this problem. I'll do it. I'll go. And he goes to teach us how to be human. The example I would use was, you're going to Papua New Guinea. They've never heard of American football. You've got to explain what a pigskin is. You've got to explain everything. I mean, all the rules, like, they've never heard of it. You're the Savior. You're the Savior. You're going to teach them how to play football. And that's going to be something that they're going to take on for the rest of their Papua New Guinea lives. History of Papua New Guinea is going to know about football because you came. But you had to come, right? They were meant to know. You know? We're, we're meant to know how we're supposed to be created, how we're supposed to live. Yeah? Christ is the one who teaches us. You know what I'm saying? The flesh is the hinge of salvation. Ugh. Think about it. Wow. We believe in God who is creator of the flesh. We believe in the word made flesh in order to redeem the flesh. This isn't John Paul. This is the catechism. We've got to get in touch with our flesh. flesh. Ah, incarnation. Incarnation. Sorry. The Annunciation. John Paul, through the fact that the Word of God became flesh, the body entered theology. Here it is. Through the main door. Uh. I remember being at the Holy Land. If you've ever been to the Holy Land, the Church of the Annunciation, phenomenal. You see where it happened. Uh. And, and there, so the common expression, right? Verbum caro factum est. The Word became flesh and lived among us, right? We've, we've heard that all our lives. Verbum caro factum est. Like, I, I've always heard that. And I remember in, in the seminary, like, I would, I would memorize the Angelus in Latin, and I would always say the verbum cata factum est, blah, blah, blah. And it was just something that was part of me. I get to the Church of the Annunciation, and I'm before the, the altar, because in every holy place there's an altar. And there, inscribed in the altar, is verbum cata eek factum est. Uh, eek. This. Here. The Word became flesh. My brain exploded. I couldn't believe it. I was in awe because I, I had said that so many times throughout my life, and now all of a sudden I'm there. The Word became flesh there, not here, not in Connecticut, not wherever. There. And I went there, and I saw it. And when you see it, you're just, you're totally enthralled. And I remember no one got excited like I did, and I remember getting back on the bus and did you see the eek? The eek? We saw the eek. Like, never in the whole world are you going to see eek in those words put together. We saw the eek. And they were like, what are you talking about? <laughs> Here, the word became flesh. The, the, and, and knowing this, knowing the theology of the body, right, we understand the value of the incarnation. We understand the value of the annunciation. What happened that day? And, and notice how we celebrate. That's a solemnity, March 25th. 
Christmas, huge solemnity. But we celebrate that moment when the Holy Spirit entered Our Lady, right? the, the Annunciation. She said, yes, fiat, and Christ, right? Again, the value of life from the moment of conception. What's a huge Marian feast day? The Immaculate Conception. We don't celebrate Mary's birthday that, like, it's a feast day. It's, it's like memorial, you know. It's not as celebrated as the Immaculate Conception. What are we celebrating on the Immaculate Conception? We're celebrating the day that St. Joachim and St. Anne, within the marital embrace, created Our Lady. Wow. The Immaculate Conception. And she was conceived immaculately. That is incredible. Think about the weight that the church puts on sex. Beautiful. It's beautiful. It's good. It's true. It's holy. More than a birthday, you know. Not to say we have to ask our parents when the day we were confused. It's kind of weird, but <laughs> but it's that's our birthday. That's when we began. Moment of conception. Wow. <laughs> Nine months. There you go. You can figure it out. Um, sacramentality of the body. We're almost done, guys. In the body of Jesus, we see our God made visible and so are caught up in the love of God we cannot see. St. Francis, right? Mystic himself, hid in the wounds of Christ so much that the wounds were made visible on him. Stigmata, right? He had stigmata. The, the mystics, the saints, St. Saint Padre Pio, right? St. Catherine of Siena, I think, had it. At least for a certain point, other famous, beautiful saints, right? Entering into these wounds. When we, when we don't have an abuse of sexuality will lead us to, to a forgetfulness or not a proper understanding, a confusion of spirituality. Yeah. They're intimately related. Beautiful quote from Peter Kraft, right? One of the great, great philosophers of our time. There are two places where God continuously reveals himself, in the Eucharist and in the womb. Wow. Wow. The beauty and mystery of sexual difference and the call to fruitful communion is what enables us to understand the body as a sign of this mystery. Wow, I'm so sorry. I'm way over. <laughs> We're almost done. Y'all are like, gosh, let me go. <laughs> sorry, everybody. Almost done, like three more slides. I wanted to get another image. I forgot to change it, but um, there's an image by Rodin, and we're actually going to look at another one of his called the cathedral, and it's a man's hand and a woman's hand, interly uh, twined, if you've ever seen this. And it's called the cathedral. Why? Because the cathedral, which aspires us to look up to God, it leads us to heaven, right? Through everything that's about it, it teaches us about heaven. So the human persons, right? So man for woman and woman for man, right? 